first of all, I'd like to thank um, the Independent Institute and Mr. David Thoreau for his wonderful work in getting this book published. Um, he is the founder of the in Independent Institute, which is a um, free market think tank. And so we'd like to uh, say thank you. Now, some of you may have heard of Fannie Lou Hamer, Mega Evers. Uh, what about Rosa Parks? Well, the fact of the matter is, and I will show you, you may not have ever heard of any of them had it not been for Dr. T.R.M. Howard. Dr. Howard, I know this is shocking, right? Yeah, well, I'll tell you about it. It wasn't the case in 1955. In 1955, this is before Martin Luther King starts. This is before uh, Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott or the walk to, from um, Selma to Montgomery. Dr. King was a key leader in civil rights in Mississippi. He was a rising star poised to achieve great fame, and that he did. He achieved national prominence after the Supreme Court ruling of the Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. And of course, that case struck down a legal segregation of public schools. And so Dr. Howard took on the charge to make sure Mississippi knew about this. And of course, when he did, he came afoul to the white Mississippians. He also played a prominent role and I heard our speaker earlier today mention the Emmett Till case. Dr. Howard played a, played a prominent role in trying to locate witnesses to help out that case and that, um, that trial about Emmett Till. How many of you know about the Emmett Till? Uh, everybody should, everybody should. And we'll give you a little bit about it a little later on. Well, because of his activities, he won praise in the black press uh, the Chicago Defender was probably the major. I heard somebody say they were from Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. The Ch Chicago Defender, one of the major black presses, probably then and now, um, ranked Dr. Howard as number one, number one on their um, 1956 uh, honor roll. That's the book. And this is Dr. Howard and his mother. Dr. Howard grew up in, I'll get back to the honor roll, but he grew up in um, Murray, Kentucky, uh, the child of um, tobacco twisters, very poor environment. And the thing that we're so proud of is that here it is, a poor child works himself up until he becomes one of the richest millionaires in the state of Mississippi during the 1950s. When he, when he left uh, and he came to school first in Alabama, and then he went out to Loma Linda uh, Medical School um, to receive his, uh, a medical doctor, is that what he wanted to be and what he became. On the date of his graduation, he met and married um, Helen Boyd. Helen Boyd was from a wealthy family uh, in California. And so what he did at that point was catapult him into the elite because from his, his background of being poor, now he meets and marries into wealth and money. Now, unlike um, most uh, civil rights workers, in the, the ones that you hear about, I think, they have to do with the church, uh, like Martin Luther King, but Dr. Howard didn't come from that. He came from um, the environment of <laughs> prosperity and businessmen and creating and making businesses and um, creating wealth. Once he received his, let me, I, I skipped something about uh, Helen that I did want to tell you, and it is this, that her brother um, was the first executive, black executive of Pepsi-Cola the very first made history. And we spent some time talking to him uh, before he passed away recently. Now, once he finished medical school, Dr. Howard went on to Mount Bayou, Mississippi. Mount Bayou, somebody from Mississippi? That's my address, that's where my people are. Oh yes, Mount Bayou, by the way, is an all black town in the Mississippi Delta. They have had only black sheriff, mayors, all of their city councilmen have always been African-American. 
and they are desperately poor. Well, he took on the job of going into Mount Bayou, Mississippi um, to be the chief surgeon of the Taborian Hospital. And the Taborian Hospital was created by um, a group called the Knights and Daughters of Tabor. And they, uh, that group, um, Fraternal Society, was founded by ex-slaves shortly after the Civil War. And what they did is like most fraternal societies, they believed, and these are common, like maybe the Loyal Order of Moose, the Odd Fellows. You've heard of the Masons and the Polish National Alliance. Most of them had rituals, colorful drill teams, um, they organized lodges, and what they did is they were providers of social welfare before the welfare state. And everything that we're going to talk about today is what Dr. Howard did without um, public funds, without welfare. They had what they call cooperative insurance. They would pay dues to the company and the company would allow them medical care, employment information, and orphanages. They had a principle uh, that they would read and believe in for, uh, and most of these types of societies believe the same thing. They pledged to advance Christianity, education, morality, and temperance, and the art of self-reliance uh, the art of self-governing, the art of true manhood and womanhood. A lot of historians t uh, tend to uh, separate people into groups and categories, but they fail to realize that the American heritage will have something in common. And so all of these people would have um, the common, the common belief in we need these things, we need good health care. And this is what Dr. Howard was providing. The Taborian Hospital opened in 19, um, this is it, 1942, about, and it included two major operating rooms. This is uh, patients, an x-ray room, sterilizer, incubator, electrocardiograph, blood bank, and a laboratory. The hospital had uh, several doctors on staff they all were African Americans, and again, Dr. Howard was indeed the chief surgeon. Because of their affiliation with this society, then children could pay maybe, what, a dollar twenty back then, seventeen dollars in dues, and they could get hospital care, and their parents could do the same. Because of this hospital, it received an enormous, an enormous um, welcoming from the blacks in the Mississippi Delta. And even the Knights and Daughters of Tabor grew rapidly because of the influence of Dr. Howard's work. It grew to more than 50,000 men, women, and children as members. The most of these members were sharecroppers, farm laborers, and despite the fact that they lived in such a desperately poor area, they were able to provide their own social welfare. <laughs> and they did this by pooling their own resources. I'll let David tell you about this, how he pulls away from Taborian and creates his own. I should be about halfway. You want to All right. take over? Okay. All right. <laughs> well, I'm a, I'll probably let you down now, but I'll, I'll do my best to, to fill her <laughs> shoes. Uh, well, Howard uh, uh, splits off and he starts his own uh, uh, hospital right across the street from the Taborian Hospital in 1948. It was called the Friendship Medical Center. And again, it offered the same kinds of services. We're talking about something like $70 a year in today's dollars for 30 days of hospital care. That's how 
cheap it was, and it was considered state of the art uh, at the time in Mississippi. A lot of these are a springboard for him starting other businesses. And again, he did marry into some money, but he made his own money, definitely. He established a, a swimming, the first swimming pool for blacks in Mississippi, Olympic sized. He had a 1,600 acre cotton and cattle plantation, a restaurant, a home construction firm. Uh, he even had a little small zoo. Um, he was not afraid to display his opulence. Uh, he, you know, other people would want to follow his example. He drove an air-conditioned Cadillac, purchased a large home. He had uh, so pastimes like raising quail and hunting dogs. And during this period, he purchased an insurance company called the Magnolia Mutual, and it sold insurance uh, to blacks. And we're going to be talking about the Magnolia in a minute because it's a very important to the future career of a civil rights leader. Well, Howard starts to move into civil rights in 1951. He founds a group called the Regional Council of Negro Leadership. They promote an agenda of self-help, mutual aid, and equal political rights. They bring all this together. He's inspired by the example of Booker T. Washington. And uh, he says that their goal, the goal of the organization is to guard our, guide our people in their civic responsibilities regarding education, registration, and voting, law enforcement, tax paying, and preservation of property, the value of saving, and in all things which will make us stable and conscientious citizens. The Mississippi civil rights organizations are built on an entrepreneurial foundation, which makes them a bit different than what you see where the church is involved in other places. Well, Howard's example had a crucial impact, and I think it's the next one. Oh, there, there's a, uh, gives you a sense of uh, his opulence. Um, he had a, why don't we go back to the previous one? We'll talk about that. Maybe I should just uh, talk about these slides as they come along here. Uh, one of the things the Regional Council is known for is its annual rallies. And sometimes they would attract 10,000 people out in the middle of nowhere in the Mississippi Delta in Mount Bayou. So many people they had to rent a circus tent to, to take in everybody. And this was a, this was a kind of shindig in a way. Uh, it provided also advice on how to go into business and that kind of thing. And seminars and how to register to vote, that kind of thing. The very first of, of the uh, annual shindigs had the gospel singer Mahalia Jackson provide the entertainment. Uh, Representative William Dawson of Illinois, who was the, uh, one of two black members of Congress. And again, they get 10,000 uh,10, people at these rallies, which they had every year. Well, this gives you a sense of the uh, wealth of the Howards, the opulence of the Howards. Uh, this is their home in Mount Bayou. Um, 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 with the other doctors of the uh, Knights and Daughters or of the uh, uh, Friendship Center. Go on to the next one. Okay, I mentioned before that Howard had purchased this company called the Magnolia Mutual Life Insurance Company. Well, he needed to hire agents. And a guy that interviewed for a job was a recent graduate of Alcorn, uh, Medgar Evers. Howard hired him to sell insurance. He also hired uh, uh, Megger's wife, Merle, uh, to uh, be a typist um, a, a for, his, for the Magnolia. And Megger would go out and sell insurance, but very much with Howard's encouragement, would sell civil rights, membership in the regional council, membership in the NAACP. He could get access to plantations because of his role as insurance salesman. He did this with Howard's support. Howard was his mentor. I asked Merle Evers about this, and he said, is that a fair description? She said, yes. He was her, without Howard, we, we probably wouldn't have heard of either one of them. So close, uh, again, he, he, you know, he is a mentor. He delivers her first two children. Uh, they live in Mount Bayou. That's a little known fact. They live in this all-black town, which is self-governing during the 1950s. Well, one of the first things the regional council does is they organize a boycott of service stations that refuse to provide restrooms for, for blacks, for African Americans. This is often the case. You'd want to use the restroom, they'd say no. So they had a slogan, don't buy gas where you can't use the restroom. There's a bumper sticker they distributed. I think it was something like 50,000. A lot of brave people 
riding their cars. And they'd get to the gas station and they'd say, I want to use the restroom. And they said, you can't. We don't have a colored restroom. And they would drive off, take that thing out of the pump. I'm heading out of here. And it was very effective and successful boycott. The st uh, service stations caved in, the national chains put pressure, and we, we have a success. Um, and this is before the Montgomery bus boycott, 1955, under very hostile conditions. Rural Mississippi was the worst place, no offense to people from Mississippi, if you're a civil, civil rights organizer in the United States during this period. Um, okay, let's go on to the next slide there. Well, Howard, again, is known for his national rallies. At the one in 1954, he brings in Thurgood Marshall, looking a little uncomfortable, standing on the, uh, sitting on the parade car there. And uh, Marshall, at the time, was uh, the counsel of the, uh, of, of, of the uh, NAACP. So uh, what they did, if any of you know about this area, you know about the famous Highway 61. They would shut down Highway 61 in Mount Bayou. They would bring, they would bring uh, all the high schools, the black colleges. They would do a whole parade. I'm sure Marshall was a little surprised by this. But again, he is one of the speakers at one of these rallies right before the Brown decision. In fact, they, they're talking about strategy. This is the membership, the leadership of the Regional Council of Negro Leadership. You see Howard at the table there. It is a kind of Du Bois kind of organization in that he gets all the leading colleges, uh, leading black businesses, leading social organizations, the heads of them to exercise, it's a good model, leadership to the masses by the leaders of the masses, all these groups, leading churches. So they can reach thousands of people. On to the next one, please. Mm, excuse me. All right. This gives you a sense of the crowds we're talking about here. Anybody read about TRM Howard in your, your textbooks? This is the kinds of crowds he's attra attracting. Uh, this is before Rosa Parks. Out in the middle of the Mississippi Delta, giving very radical and inflammatory speeches, attacking Jim Crow. There was a senator from Mississippi named Bilbo who was a notorious racist who died a few years earlier. And Howard used to say, well, you know what? I just, uh, the governor just got a message from Senator Bilbo. And uh, uh, it's a message from hell to the governor. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he told the governor, ease up on the black people. And the governor says, well, why should I do that? He says, look, we got a Negro fireman down here and he's keeping it mighty hot for us. And uh, he, he would say this in public, and he survived somehow. And it was reported in the newspapers. On the next one. Now we got to see some uh, Black Guns Matter people. You might like this. See the gun there, the rifle? Every rally of the regional council, were, guns were everywhere. And Howard was dedicated to violence, but he was willing to fire back. And whites knew it. White racists knew it, so there was nobody Killed. And why? Because they knew people would shoot back. They knew they'd shoot back. Someone went into Howard's home and noticed all the guns. He said, he's a gun in the corner. And he had a Thompson submachine gun. And the guy says, I don't know how he got that. All right, but he did. All right, there you go. Uh, and he was also a bit of a cook there, too. So he had the, Howard was the kind of guy, if you had a janitor at a, a conference or something, he would single out that guy, and he'd, he'd want to know all about him. He had very much the common touch. He'd make time for people. That's why he was so popular. All right, there he is at a conference about uh, police brutality in the Mississippi Delta, which he, he definitely would publicize. Now, the Emmett Till case, September 1955. Emmett Till, I, I don't think I need to tell you the story there. He's 14-year-old, killed. He's from Chicago. He goes to Mississippi to visit his great uncle. He's killed by these two guys. And Howard immediately, even before they know Till, Till is dead, he's saying there's going to be hell to pay in Mississippi. He does an investigation. Emmett Till's mother, and again, you, you heard about this guy before? Emmett Till's mother stays with Dr. Howard when, he comes to Missi when she comes to Mississippi. Hold on for a second. He please. gives her an armed escort to the trial. Right? Hold, hold and there are other witnesses. Excuse me? Is there anybody in here that does not know the story of Emmett Till? Okay, let me tell it uh, right quick and then we'll let him finish. <laughs> Emmett Till was a 14-year-old boy out of Chicago. 
He took a train ride to Money, Mississippi to visit his great uncle, uh, Mose. And while he was there, they pick cotton, and then they go to the store and get a soda. Well, they went to the store to get the soda, and there was a pretty lady behind the counter. So Emmett starts bragging to his friends, oh, I date white girls, I got a white girl in uh, Chicago. Oh man, come on, we don't believe that. He had some little picture from, uh, probably from the, um, the wallet, you know, with the pictures already in it and showed it to him. So he goes in there and he says something to her. And whatever he says, or touches her hand instead of putting the money on the table, whatever he does, is against protocol for the Deep South in 1955. And everybody knows it, and everybody's afraid. The cousins run in and get him out, and of course, um, the husband and the brother-in-law are told they come to Moses, Uncle Moses' house about one or two in the morning, and with guns, and they go through the house, and they get this boy out of the house. They take him in a truck, they take him several places. We know they went to um, the cotton gin, went to a barn. But in the end, they made it to the Tallahatchie River. At the Tallahatchie River, after they have beat him, blooded him to unrecognizable battery, they say to him, do you still believe blacks are as good as whites? He said, yes, they blew his brains out. Once they did that, they tied a cotton gin fan and threw him over in the Tallahatchie River, thinking he'll sink to the bottom. Well, he doesn't because the roots catch the wheel and a foot sticks up and somebody sees it. But uh, one other thing, I'm a, uh, did we see Willie Reed? The second from the left, Willie Reed was about 21 years old when this happened. And he heard the beating in the barn. He came to get some water from a pump and he heard um, Lord have mercy, mama please help somebody. He would hear all of that and he ran down to Miss uh, Bradley right there with the hat, the rag on Emmett Till's mother right there. No, yeah. no, not, not. Oh not, yeah, yeah, the other. Yeah, Amanda, sure. Amanda, Amanda yeah, Bradley. And he said, Miss Bradley, somebody's beating somebody in that barn, come on up. And they went up, so they were witnesses at the trial. Um, and the, Willie Reed had enough nerve to actually testify. But all of it gave him a nervous breakdown. After the trial, they sent him to Chicago, and he was never the same. And uh, 50 years later, when I talked to Mamie Till Mobley, Emmett Till's mother on the phone, her voice still cracked before she died. We talked to her to get all this research, of course. And after 50 years, she still had not gotten over the death of her only son, only son. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah, go on, we can go on to the next one. Um, okay, I'll talk a, a little bit about what would happen at the trial. Howard did not think there would be conviction, but he did his best. We've written a movie script, by the way, if any of you know anyone that's a producer, and because we think it's a fantastic story. They're out at midnight at 1 in the morning trying to find witnesses, working with white reporters. There are whites helping them, trying to find witnesses and evidence, and many of the witnesses and evidence are found by Howard. Unfortunately, it is not successful. The white jury is just not going to convict these two brothers who were, who were actually tried for killing Emmett Till, these white brothers, which is something that didn't happen very often in and of itself. They are acquitted after about an hour of deliberation by the jury, and the jury foreman said we would have, we would have acquitted them earlier, but we had to go get some pop. You know, so that gives you an idea of the attitude. But if people thought that it was going to die off, the story was going to die off, they were wrong about it because Howard immediately goes on a speaking tour. Let me say this briefly, it's sort of out of order here, but before the Emmett Till case, we have groups like the Citizens Councils denying credit, <laughs> denying uh, uh, employment to African Americans. Howard has a great idea to deal with that because these people couldn't get loans. He said, well, there's a black owned bank called Tri-State Bank. He happened to be on the board of directors. Let's encourage all the black businesses and fraternal organizations throughout the United States to put their money in Tri-State in Memphis and if a person can't get loans because of pressure by white citizens councils, what we will do is we'll give them a loan. And it was a way to do an end run around these local and it was very successful and weakened the ability uh, to put pressure. 
This gives you a sense of the role Howard is, how important he is. This is from the Chicago Defender again. There's a cartoon. Those two little guys down there is TRM Howard and Roy Wilkins, head of the NAACP, following behind, coming to the rescue after several lynchings and killings in Mississippi, including Emmett Till. Howard is seen as the leader trying to get justice in this case. Go on the next one, please. All right, now again, he goes all around the country giving speeches, uh, sponsored by the NAACP. There's one he gives in uh, Baltimore, and there's the reaction of the crowd. He's speaking to bigger crowds there, 20,000 people sometimes, than he'd ever spoken to before. On to the next one, please. This is, uh, again, get, again, you heard of this guy? This is in Philadelphia. That's Howard on the stage. They're, here to, they're there to hear him talking about the Emmett Till case. This is really raising consciousness about the case after the acquittal. People are starting to talk about it much more. On to the next point. Well, one of the things Howard does during his speeches is he criticizes the FBI, which is not something you do in 1956. He says if FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover can find who blew up a plane by looking at the wreckage and brag about it, why can't he ever seem to find out when a black person is killed in Mississippi who was responsible? Hoover was so mad by this that he wrote an open letter to the press to Howard uh, criticizing him. And uh, uh, unfortunately, a lot of leading black figures did not like that. They had good relationships with Hoover, including Thurgood Marshall, who is, interestingly enough, working with Hoover to discredit Howard under the surface. Uh, Juan Williams wrote about this in a book, uh, is a chapter called Machiavelli and Marshall. Marshall's theory was he wanted a good relationship with Hoover because that could help if he needed his help. But he called Howard, which is an apt description, a rugged individualist <laughs> and said, this guy, you know, uh, has got to be under control. Roy Wilkins, though, the NAACP, the actual head of it, was a good friend of Howard and thought he was a great guy and wanted to encourage him. So they weren't all of one mind. Howard ends up moving to Chicago in 1956, and we really don't have time to talk about that period or why he moved and so forth, but one of the first things he does is he runs for Congress against Dawson, the same guy that he would brought in in uh, Chicago. Unfortunately, he loses, but there he is with uh, running again. He's running as a Republican, uh, meeting the president at the time, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. On to the next one. Uh, now, Howard is in Chicago, one of his favorite pastimes. Here's politically incorrect for you, is he was a big, bang, a big game hunter. He argued that he was the leading American, African American big game hunter in the world, and you know, who am I to disagree with that? And he had a room in his house called the Safari Room, which was considered a kind of center of black pride. Emma Till's mother, we interviewed, said she used to take her school children there. She used to teach school. And they were inspired by it. Black man did all of this. And now, of course, people go all as animals. And Howard's like, well, whatever. You know, it's what I do. It's what I like to do. All right? He was a good shot. Uh, when he was a boy, he would hunt for the family. And his mother would give him three shotgun shells. And he said, you got three shells. That's all you got, or we're going to go hungry tonight. And you go out and you hunt for the food. Well, one of the things he was known for was his parties, uh, which would dominate the social pages in the Chicago Defender. A lot of whites attended these, a lot of blacks, a lot of celebrities. Here he is being crowned king of the party by the Olympic athlete Jesse Owens, a fellow Republican and good friend. Um, so they were working together. On to the next point, please. All right. He founds a, a medical center in Chicago, the largest on the south side, called the Friendship Medical Center. All the nurses are dressed in like Florence, Night, Florence Nightingale kind of garb, which he always, you know, there's Howard, the snappy dresser, changes wardrobe like three times a day. Um, he would say, you know, he'd get, get the best underwear, and he found out, you know, who, you know, this guy, Hugh Hefner, had the best underwear, the most, he'd get that, you know, that kind. He was, he was totally yeah, uh, comfortable, but he was a down-to-earth guy. He was a regular guy, but he was very comfortable with uh, making money. He had no problem with making money at all. In fact, he used to say to people, that was what he did. He urged them to go into business. People would criticize him because he was a Republican, by the way. And one guy said, well, Joe McCarthy 
How could you be in the same party with Joe McCarthy? He said, well, I have some problems with that maybe, but I'd rather be in the same party with somebody who believes a communist is hiding under every bed than in the party of my Democratic Senator, Senator Eastland, who believes a Negro should be dangling from every tree. So, heck, who haven't you offended with that kind? That's the way he was. On to the next point. Okay, well, there's the staff of his medical center in Chicago. Um, again, uh, sitting there, king of, the, king of the place. On to the next one. Before we go on to the next one, uh, I wanted to interject, when we talk about businesses, not only did he create his own medical center, he also created, back in Mount Bayou, a restaurant. He um, had a swimming pool. He had the insurance company. So he continued to buy and create his own businesses, along with his uh, plantation, a 1,600-acre uh, producing plantation. Yeah, in one of the poorest parts of the country. He does all of this. Well, there he is. I love that picture. There he is. Now, again, you couldn't get away with that anymore, but there are his animals <laughs> on his big game hunting. And he kind of makes a kind of free market argument in a way. He says, look, uh, you've got poaching, you've got all this stuff going on in Africa. And a lot of this is because uh, you don't have uh, you know, private ownership of game preserves or of, of the animals and so forth. So he, you know, it's, he, interestingly enough, sort of made that argument. He says poaching is a lot worse in those countries that don't allow some degree of private ownership. All right, he dies in 1976 after several years of deteriorating he health. Um, Reverend Jesse Jackson officiated at the funeral. Well, uh, Dr. Howard helped to give Jesse his start in Chicago. Uh, and people used to say, oh, Jesse came there all the time to Howard's office. And it's an interesting question as to why Jesse Jackson won't talk to us. But uh, over <laughs> seven years, he, uh, you know, we called Jesse Jackson over and over and over again. Apparently, he's usually accessible, would not talk to us. But anyway, he is crucial. Operation Push, at the time, is founded in Dr. Howard's safari room of his home. That's how important he was to that organization. They later had a falling out and made up and had a falling out. But it is a little frustrating to us. We were not able to get a guy that you know would know some things about Dr. Howard. So makes you, makes you wonder. But I guess that's about it. Let me just say that Howard is a product of an environment in Mississippi of self-help, of fraternal societies, of business. And it's a Booker T. Washington strategy. A lot of people see Booker T. Washington as an accommodationist or something like that. Washington's view was you set up all these businesses, you set up a black middle class, and guess what? People will then have the wherewithal to pursue civil rights. And guess what? He was right. That is exactly what happened. The growth of the black middle class led to the civil rights movement. It was built on that foundation. And Washington was, that was his view. Well, thank you very much. Books are in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs>